all of you that are joining us for this session. Uh, thank you. Uh, if you can, please stay muted until you are ready to speak so that we can uh, keep the audio as clear as possible. Please do try to keep your camera on so that we can make this as much of an active and um, an engaged discussion as we can. We're going to get uh, rid of slides so we can all see each other in the next couple of minutes. Uh, at this time, we'd love to start using the chat function. So please take a moment and introduce yourself and your organization in the chat. Uh, over the next 55 minutes. Please also use the chat function to provide comments, feedback, and uh, raise questions. If you'd like to be called during our conversation uh, to ask a question or, or make a comment, please use the raise hand function in Zoom, and we'll try to get to as many people as possible. Uh, and we do ask everyone to try to keep their comments or questions uh, as brief as possible so that we can get as many people into this discussion as we can. Um, last comment here is that uh, a note that this public this meeting is public. We do want this to be open to all. So we are recording this session and the uh, recording will be available publicly uh, very soon after we're done. Uh, with that, uh, let's go to the next slide and I'll tell you what we're going to do this uh, morning or afternoon. Um, after I'm done introducing our program, I will turn it over to my colleague Lisa Bourget who will help us moderate two conversations that are gonna uh, flow together. The first is on what uh, at the country level people are doing to uh, introduce test and treat programs uh, with oral antivirals. At the second half hour, we're gonna focus on lessons learned uh, in terms of clinical protocol development and how we might best define high-risk populations for access to oral antivirals. Um, go to the next slide, we will see uh, a bit of um, who we are and what we do. The COVID Treatment Quick Start Consortium brings together several organizations, including Duke University, AmeriCares, the Clinton Health Access Initiative, and the COVID Collaborative as implementing partners. And it's made possible through the generous support of the Open Society Foundations, Pfizer, and the Conrad and Hilton Foundation. Uh, the work that we are undertaking is really to support governments to introduce and scale up access to new and effective COVID-19 oral antiviral therapies to high-risk populations. Secondly, to undertake operational research so that we can better identify and share what's working and what the challenges are in that process. And third, to try to work on accelerated access to affordable and generic oral antivirals uh, all over the world. Uh, you see listed here the 10 partner countries uh, in which and with whom we are working over an 18-month period of time. Uh, next, you'll see here in the picture that uh, the work is, is underway, the planning has been ongoing for some time, uh, and the, the product, the Paxlovid donated from Pfizer, is already moving, uh, and this is a picture from the AmeriCare's warehouse of it on its way. Uh, so we're very excited that this uh, 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 therapy is going to be available uh, quite soon in several countries and um, that you see listed here. If we go to the next slide. Uh, you'll see that we are going to um, launch today this learning network, which is a core part of our work through Quick Start. Uh, the rationale for holding this uh, learning network is fourfold. First, is really to provide a, a platform for all of you, for stakeholders at the country level especially, as well as globally, to understand uh, what's happening and, and, and meet the needs that you have. Secondly, we want to capture and be able to share your successes, lessons learned in developing and implementing test and treat programs uh, and enable rapid dissemination of good practices. Uh, third, we want to um, identify what shared challenges may be and use these also to start some problem solving together to address those challenges in real time. And fourth, we want to use this uh, to understand where best we might deploy operational research capabilities to actually generate stronger evidence to make sure that we can pass that along over time. Uh, with that, let me introduce our um, discussants today in our first half hour. Uh, we're going to be joined by Professor Lloyd Malenga, who's the Director of Infectious Diseases for the Ministry of Health in Zambia, and secondly by Dr. Edson uh, Ruangasore, who's the Division Manager at the Rwanda Biomedical Center's Surveillance Division. They'll be leading our discussion with participation from all of you around preparing for the introduction of test and treat programs. Uh, the second half hour today on the next slide you'll see is uh, talking about uh, how we think about clinical protocols to identify uh, high-risk populations. We'll be joined by Dr. Cameron Wolf, who's our research lead for Quick Start and is also an associate professor of medicine 
here at Duke University. And we also uh, have with us uh, Dr. Tajuddin Raji, who's the head of public health institutes and research for the Africa CDC. Uh, with that, we can take the slides down. And uh, for the first conversation, let me turn the floor over to my colleague, Lisa Bourget. Thank you all. Thank you, Krishna. Um, and thank you everyone for being here uh, this morning and this afternoon and this evening. Um, we'll start with the first panel, um, which is where we really want to share learnings thus far on the um, preparation for introducing uh, the test and treat program with oral antivirals. And I want to thank again, Dr. Edson and Professor Malenga for being with us. Um, a note to the audience, um, we'll be uh, asking questions of the panelists for the first 10 to 12 minutes. Um, please queue up your questions for this panel in chat and or be, be ready to raise your hand when we're ready for, for questions. So um, Dr. Edson uh, and Professor Malenga, if you can get on camera. Um, Dr. Edson, I'd like to start with you. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about how the test and treat programs being structured in Rwanda and, and sort of what, what was considered in terms of sites selected um, and uh, facility entry points? Um, so over to you. Thank you, thank you, Lisa. Uh, the treatment landscape uh, of, uh, of, of, of COVID in Rwanda evolved over time. And uh, for this round, I think it provides us with a great opportunity uh, to deal with this pandemic. Uh, until recently, most uh, patients uh, needed care within first settings and uh, where people were, uh, had to use monoclonal treatment uh, but the, this use of Paxlovid uh, is now a great opportunity, and uh, it's also uh, as it tends to go uh, within the primary care, primary care settings. So uh, we, within the country, uh, we try to anchor this approach within uh, the primary health care, which is the health center. Uh, it's one of it's uh, a decentralized level uh, where uh, nurses uh, are able to test and also provide treatment. Uh, uh, initially, I think uh, we, 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 with this approach, uh, most of people used to, to be fired and, uh, and also uh, the out-of-pocket money was too high. And uh, that's why we, we thought uh, this approach of uh, using the standardized level, uh, using the health center, uh, building the capacity and be also leveraging on already what is already exists within the health setting. Uh, it provided us uh, that uh, opportunity to be able to, to tap into uh, the resources and ensure that people have access to Paxlovid. Great, thank you. Um, Professor Malenga, could you also share um, your, uh, I guess your experience so far um, as you structure this program in Zambia? Professor Malenga, are you with us? Okay, while well, we're working out, um, um, ah, there we go. Wonderful to see you. Professor Thank Malenga. you uh, so much. And uh, are you able to hear me? Yes, yes, we are. So let me let me repeat the question that I um, sort of opened with. Um, can you share with the audience sort of how the test and treat program is going to be structured in Zambia, um, and why was this approach um, chosen? So then, in Zambia, we we have uh, those regions. Uh, uh, we have uh, tertiary hospitals, uh, then also we have uh, the first and also second level hospitals. And uh, below the first level hospitals, we have the primary healthcare units. Now uh, that is the public uh, structure. Then we also have the private structure uh, where we have uh, a number of players as well, uh, offering private uh, uh, primary healthcare 
uh, and also uh, goes all the way up to tertiary uh, uh, level care. So what we did consider for us is that uh, we needed to have first of all equity in the distribution of services. So we had to make sure that uh, each of the provinces we selected 13 uh, hospitals in the public sector. Uh, and each of those 13, uh, there were a number of facilities uh, as well, which are feeding into those. Uh, that way we have the mix of having um, a tertiary level uh, hospitals providing uh, the test and treat. Um, and also we have the primary uh, health units as well uh, providing such a service. But beyond that, we did uh, uh, think of engaging also the private sector. Uh, so we have some private hospitals and we also have planned to have uh, some of the, uh, the primary health units, which are catering for a population of about uh, 2,000 to 7,000 individuals where uh, the access to these larger units may be limited. So we included them as well in the selection of the site. So our selection criteria has been based on uh, distribution of the facilities and also for us to make sure that we have equity uh, in terms of the service provision. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, th thank you both for providing that context. Um, so we're seeing a decrease globally in um, COVID-19 testing activities. Um, what, what are your respective uh, country approaches to finding um, uh, oral antivir antivirals and the, and the need for early patient identification? So um, Dr. Edson, could you, could you start that question? Yes, uh, we have been observing the decreased number of testing capacity over time. And uh, actually in Rwanda, it has been driven by the fact that uh, most people have been vaccinated. Uh, the second factor in that came out is, is due to the fact that after the good coverage of vaccine, uh, uh, they, 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 they like listen a bit of some of the uh, requirements, including people uh, were required to get tested before uh, going to any kind of event and also for travels. So with this, we had a decrease number of people uh, who got tested on daily basis, meaning uh, looking at the data, we moved from more than 10,000 per day uh, up to estimated 3,000 per day. So uh, this really uh, hinders in terms of uh, getting more people getting tested. Uh, and that's how we were not kind of strategizing and making sure on how we can uh, uh, test more people and also uh, getting more people and also linking them for for, for, for treatment. Uh, with this, we, we have put in place uh, two strategies. Uh, one is to test uh, everyone who in, in kind of triage, uh, since this is being done within the health center level. So everyone who is coming into the health center uh, will be required to be tested. So by doing this, we'll be able to at least test more people and also uh, provide them with medication. Another thing that we're doing is, uh, we've been also doing this before, uh, is the random testing. Uh, we have been testing uh, using the drive-through testing within the city of Kigali, but also uh, other strategic uh, testing high-risk groups and high-risk areas, uh, including markets. And uh, so we want to revamp this and make sure that we test more people. Uh, we will be doing this more frequent, uh, at least we just to ensure that we, 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 we again get back to uh, to, to, to the number of people being tested on at least more than 10,000. So I think this will be a good, good quite number that will be uh, allow us to, to get uh, more people being positive and also uh, linking them for, for care. Mm, thank you. Yeah, th thank you for sharing, I guess, both of those testing strategies. Um, Professor Malenga, uh, what, I guess, what approach uh, are you taking to um, testing? So we have integrated um, uh, all the test and treat approach into um, our Ministry of Health approach, and uh, we are strongly linking this to um, our surveillance. Um, indeed, yes, the numbers have decreased uh, for those that are testing positive, but also uh, our screening has also reduced. We have revised our guidelines, and uh, anyone who is visit the health facility with symptoms uh, suggestive of COVID who's going to be tested. Uh, then also uh, we have those that are admitted in the, in the facilities, they are also going to be tested. 
We have um, uh, brought on board um, the health promotions unit of the Minister of Health to again re-engage the community on the need for testing for COVID uh, for early treatment. We have also, uh, again, with the support of CHAI, uh, engaging the private sector as well. Uh, and we, we believe that uh, with using um, the tertiary hospitals, using the, uh, the primary health units, uh, combined with uh, the increased awareness and sensitization using the health promotions unit, we should have uh, more people testing and those that are positive accessing the services which are providing. So these are the interventions which are, we have put in place. Uh, so more of health promotions and also a closer link to uh, our health promotions unit uh, and also uh, a closer link to our surveillance system under the Zambia National Public Health Institute. Thank you, thank you. Um, Professor Malenga, if I could stay with you as we move to this next question. Um, how are you thinking of integrating this test and treat um, approach that you just talked about into high risk populations in, into sort of routine care. So as we think about both, um, I guess the li living with COVID, but also um, what we're learning about test, test and treatment um, moving forward. Um, could you comment a little bit on that? Professor Malenga, could you hear me? Uh, I could not hear uh, the questions entirely, but I, I think maybe you may be asking on uh, how are we trying to integrate uh, the test and treat to cover the high risk populations. I don't know if that's uh, uh, what you did try to ask. My network is bad, so I could not have uh, maybe picked all the, the components of the question. Yeah, no, I was asking about how you're going to integrate this test and treatment approach into routine care. Um, again, excellent point. Um, from the beginning, we have tried to um, put that as part of our core activities of the Ministry of Health. We have uh, various uh, um, services which go on. We have uh, the HIV clinics where we have uh, uh, populations we know who are going to benefit from this. We have also uh, medical clinics for diabetics, for those with hypertension. Uh, we also have large units uh, for those with cancer disease in the oncology as well. So all these units are going to be impacted. Even right now, we're doing a lot more testing compared to the other populations. And uh, it's now part of the guideline. The test and treat is part of the national COVID guidelines. As a result, we believe that integrating uh, the test and treat into the existing routine programs is easier because it's now owned by the Ministry of Health and it's part of our guidelines. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. And, and Dr. Edson, how are you thinking about integrating um, this test and treat approach into routine care? In in your country? Yes, I think the, the first approach was um, uh, putting this or embedding, anchoring this within the health center. And then uh, as we move forward, uh, we're looking at uh, having it integrated within uh, different services, you're looking at the all health centers, 500 health centers within the country. Uh, there are uh, HIV clinics, we have NCD clinics. So we are training now those nurses to be able to have capacity at least to, to, to treat. Otherwise, uh, they're already trained on testing and we don't want to be testing and referring patients to, to hospitals, but we rather want to test and treat. So uh, we are looking at how we'd be integrating, uh, especially looking on those two main uh, clinics that, that are already operational uh, within the health center level. So we, we, we are trying to now build the capacity uh, in terms of uh, uh, prescribing this medication and be able to prescribe Paxlovid uh, after testing. Thank you. Um, so now I'd like to shift to uh, the audience to um, sort of start our Q&A session. Um, just again, a reminder, if you have a question um, for on this panel, um, you can put that in the chat. 
and also raise your hand. And I see Sean, um, uh, you, you've got your hand raised, so please go ahead. And then- Thanks, Lisa. Ahead. Yeah, and, and uh, no, um, our questions are starting to come into the chat. So I, I felt I would uh, kick us off here with a, with a question from, for Prof Malenga. Uh, Prof, you mentioned, and, and, I, and I hope you can hear me okay, and I'll, I'll, I'll reiterate the question if it's not coming through clearly. Um, you mentioned utilizing the health promotions unit within the Ministry of Health to, to get the word out on the benefit of oral antivirals um, and the need to get to the health faci facility quickly, you know, within five days of symptom onset in order to see the benefit of them. Can you talk a little bit more practically speaking about how the health promotions unit within the Ministry of Health will actually get the word out? and what tools they'll actually use to, to do that and how they may be targeting high-risk groups and, and the, the populations within Zambia that really need to hear this message. So if you could speak to a little bit more about how the Health Promotions Unit will actually go about, about that messaging, I think that would be really helpful for the audience to hear. Uh, thank you so much. Um, first, I need to say that um, for us, in fact, we are a little bit uh, late. When we embraced the test and treat approach, we engaged our leadership and uh, the Minister of Health went uh, on air um, and uh, this was covered across the country, uh, various uh, media fora, um, the, the radio, TV stations, um, uh, the print media as well, on how we are going to introduce uh, the test and treat. And uh, we had seen, in fact, a high number of people uh, even asking uh, where these drugs were available. Unfortunately, we have not received them uh, then and even yet. And that led to also us not really uh, uh, emphasizing much. So we have already started the work with the highest level in the Ministry of Health announcing the need for uh, the test and treat approach. The Health Promotions Unit which is uh, anchored within the Ministry of Health has, uh, uh, has been tasked with a number of, uh, of things to do. One, um, in the weekly uh, media briefings which we have, once we receive the drugs, this will be one of the key uh, messages which we'll be, uh, we'll be emphasizing on. And this is, uh, um, this is done on a weekly level, uh, either by the Minister uh, or by the permanent secretary, but in the weekly press releases, we're going to be uh, mentioning that we have the drugs now available and they need to have access. Besides that, we have um, deliberate sessions, uh, which are um, at many, many areas, uh, at uh, the district areas. Um, we have uh, engaged the local media, uh, health promotions unit will be using those to disseminate the information. Uh, and these um, uh, local radio uh, stations, local TV stations. Um, then also, uh, as we do uh, the other messaging, in this case, we are doing a lot of polio. Um, as you know, we have uh, uh, recorded um, some, uh, some, some cases in this region and also in our country, of course, not cases. Um, um, and we also have uh, a lot of other infectious diseases which are prone in our area cholera uh, yeah, maybe because our neighboring country has been affected. So we are integrating this message into the other uh, health promotion uh, uh, messages which we are running currently. And these are going all the way up to grassroots level, up to community level. The third one is engaging uh, the local structures. We are going to engage uh, our uh, um, um, our area councillors, which are on the political side, and also the traditional leaders as well. We use this approach for COVID uh, uh, vaccine. Um, before uh, last year, you may, maybe you may have heard our country was at 3%. Uh, by August last year, we're now at 78%, largely because we use the local structures. So we are going to use that approach where we use the community. We use also the media at different levels. Uh, what we are really waiting for right now is to have the commodities available uh, and for us to finalize a few things in terms of M and E to kickstart this. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Edson. Would you like to add anything? Dr. 
Dr. Edson, do you want to come in on this question? No, that's okay. Okay. Um, so Brooke, uh, also, uh, if you want to go next, and then uh, I think there's two questions in the chat. We'll go Lorraine and then Adrian after Brooke. Over to you, Brooke. So my question is is somewhat a follow up of, of Sean's, uh, and and also on community level uh, health literacy uh, advocacy for test and treat, and and also testing. It, it, it sounds to me, it seems to me that particularly if we're focusing on highest risk populations, uh, not all of them are uh, can engage in health seeking and go to health centers. Uh, the outreach at the community level uh, through uh, community health worker self-testing and, and or self-testing, particularly when people are symptomatic and they know that, that COVID is a possibility because they've received health literacy, that that might be an additional way to identify uh, a, a larger cohort of highest risk patients. So I wonder about the the perspective of both countries on uh, relying more on community based testing, not facility based testing, including on self testing, and the importance of of really the test and treat health literacy at the individual and community level to understand the importance of responding to symptoms and getting tested and and connecting very quickly to care for assessment for treatment. Yes, uh, say thank you, Doc. Yeah, yeah you, you bring a, a very important point, and I think uh, um, both of us have referred to the need to have the community engaged and also the need to have strong uh, health promotion at uh, community level, besides the testing in the facilities. Uh, we have to make a balance of how we do that. Uh, we know that uh, there are cost implications on uh, how much we can do in terms of testing. And also we have to be very, very selective on uh, uh, who we test. But I think importantly is to make our people know that what is needed is early testing uh, whenever someone has symptoms uh, and also uh, approaching uh, the health um, uh, facilities uh, to provide that. In our second phase for Zambia, we are introducing these in the private pharmacies as well. These are close to the community. So if we can, uh, and we are also setting up some testing points in the community. If we can have these and work well, we think that will be a better way uh, of accessing these services closer to the people as opposed to the facilities. But in the facilities, I need to say that it's also important we have some of the people who are at high risk and uh, some may be admitted and some may be accessing the services. So it's a mix of uh, both scenario facility and also community-based approaches. Thank you. Yes, uh, I think so. I think it's really a good approach to, to, to engage community health workers, especially in terms of uh, testing. So. Uh, uh, initially, we, we were looking at how we, we could set up a system that should be able to capture most of the information, uh, especially for people who will be tested, uh, people who will be having symptoms. And uh, already in the country, we have already set up that system. Uh, it will be kind of uh, within the short SMS. And uh, uh, as we move forward, we are looking at how we can use the community health workers uh, to start testing at the community level. So uh, this would be one of the a game changer in terms of uh, uptake of testing and also linking to, to care. So in Rwanda, we have more than 45,000 uh, community health workers and uh, we're looking toward to uh, building the capacity uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of testing and also linking uh, for, for care within the health center. Uh, maybe just to also flag out that uh, as uh, how the structure is, is structured in, within the country, the health center itself uh, is uh, in less than uh, five kilometers. So uh, we'll be able to test and also linking uh, patients to, to go and get uh, the, the treatment since we, 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 we opt not to use the community health workers in terms of uh, uh, treating or providing Paxlovid at this point. Thank you both. Um, we're going to need to move to our next panel, um, but I want to acknowledge that Lorraine and Adrian have two questions in the chat. And if I could ask Dr. Edson and 
Professor Malenga to address that in chat. Um, that would be wonderful. Um, so now I wanna move us to our second panel. Um, and I'd like to invite um, Cam and Taj uh, to, to uh, be on camera and Rianne, if you could spotlight them both. Um, we're gonna turn the discussion towards um, sharing learnings and lessons uh, so far on the clinical protocol development for defining high-risk populations. Um, so thank you, Cam and, and Taj for joining us and um, making yourself available. Um, Cam, I wanna start with you. Um, and um, if you could sort of set the stage for uh, the audience, um, from your experience, who, has, who is at the highest risk and what's the evidence base? Yeah, thanks so much, Lisa, and thanks for giving us all this chance to discuss here. I really appreciate it. Um, you know, I I, I'm, I don't want to preach the converted in terms of who's at high risk. To some extent, this should be well known after a number of years to this audience in particular. But maybe the right way to think through this is how did how did we think through high risk stratifications when it came to the rollout of of, of this test and treat program? I think if you come back, sort of throw yourself back to early 2020 days, most of what we now realize um, is, is high risk for COVID in terms of bad outcomes was all really driven towards those sort of serious inflammatory pneumonias that we, that we saw um, disturbingly a lot of in 2020 and 2021. And I think as you've already heard from some of the, some of the speakers this morning, maybe a little less of more recently, they were pretty uh, high income centric um, risk factors in terms of how they were generated and our knowledge of that. Um, I think a lot of that information was gleaned initially out of sort of larger sort of multinational cohorts and national cohorts within such groups as um, European and North American CDC. Some of the early data out of China certainly drove our understanding of that. Where it became important from us was to say, well, if we're gonna try and introduce a program that allows for more rapid access to antivirals. We don't want to reinvent the wheel in terms of, of how we think about high risk stratification. So let's use some of the um, sort of measured and proven high risk categories that we already know and apply that um, as closely here as we can for two reasons. One is that you want to be nimble if you're trying to implement something like this. But secondly, um, that was where all the data was driven for the for the for the medications themselves. So if we go back to the early work done, um, particularly by Pfizer, but remembering that this protocol exists um, open for other antivirals too that may be available, their fundamental foundational trials were also driven on high risk factors um, that you see in the protocol here: age, uh, obesity, diabetes chronic, chronic uh, disease, particularly cardiorespiratory, but frankly also sort of um, a, a obesity, liver disease, immunosuppression. And so, you know, the, the, the kind of things that you see in the protocol here were all driven from early multinational understanding of the way COVID played out and then transpired into the actual trials. I think what we want to be careful of here was to not go beyond data that we understand from an efficacy and safety point of view of these medications, all of the data that gets driven behind our understanding of the way they work was based on those high risk features. And so to be able to transpose those into the context of the countries to which um, this program is rolling out, I think was the, the sort of the idea. Having said that, I think something that we also need to be cautious of is it's very easy to miss the fact that the different ratios and, and incidence of some of those high-risk features may be different in every country to which this is applied. And again, I think this is an audience well-versed, I suspect, in, in understanding that every country's uh, understanding of their own high-risk features is going to be different. The rates of those are going to be different. We've already heard discussion um, in the first session about how an individual country's um, recognition of where their high risk features are in their population affects the way that they communicate with their population, how they get the messaging about testing and treating out to that group. So it's going to become incumbent upon this program to really continue to sort of iteratively look at high risk data that we collect and understand whether we're trying to, you know, whether the program's hitting the right target populations. Um, 
But to go back to the original beginning here, we've started from a point of view of saying, we know the foundational data comes out of large multinational cohorts, understanding high risk. We should apply this as closely to that initially as possible. And that that will also nicely overlay where all of the data was for the use of these drugs. Thanks, Cam. Um, Taj, I'd love to get your thoughts on, um, I guess, your the data that you're looking at. Um, what risk of risk factors are you observing? And I guess to Cam's point, how much of the foundational knowledge that we have from mostly high income countries, how does that translate differ um, in uh, in an African context? I think you're on. You may be muted, Tosh. Oh, thank you, um, Lisa. Thank you, Cameroon, for setting the stage for this particular um, session. And uh, thank you, uh, Duke University, for inviting um, Africa CDC to be part of this discussion. Uh, let me start by saying that um, when it comes to clinical trials, generally, uh, COVID-19 therapeutics inclusive, we have very few um, trials taking place on the continent. So I think uh, I want to see that one of the outcome of this is to ensure that uh, we bring equity to that space, you know. Now, uh, specific to your question now on the issue of uh, risk uh, uh, factors that we are seeing on the continent, uh, it's not pretty much different from what Cameron has said, but taking into consideration that we have very few member states who are actually part and parcel of uh, the COVID-19 uh, trial. I think uh, for uh, our continent, uh, largely is um, South Africa and uh, perhaps um, Egypt, you know. So, but having said that, what we're getting from those countries, including things like um, age, you know, has been perceived as, um, I mean, uh, is seen as um, high risk. And of course, uh, common co comorbid conditions or common chronic medical conditions like hypertension, like diabetes, you know, like chronic kidney disease and so on and so forth are also some of those are risk factors. Of course, pregnancy is um, also an issue I'm here. And of course, apart from a high risk based on the clinical parameters. We also have high risk based on logistic and um, some uh, sort of um, access um, issues, you know, especially when it comes to the hard to reach um, areas, you know, so these are people either uh, by out of omission or commission, we have um, excluded them. And of course, we also have groups, you know, who are truly, truly, you know, difficult to really uh, bring them uh, on board. And uh, again, the community, is also wary of they are being um, exploited really voluntary I mean um, um, access or voluntary uh, uh, permission to be part of the study so for instance children for instance people in the correction centers prison and so on and so forth so I think for me these are some of the uh, uh, high risk uh, I mean groups we are seeing on the uh, uh, continent but again you will ask me that uh, should these people truly constitute high risk as far as COVID-19 I mean uh, intervention is concerned because when you look at this group these are also the group that are likely to come down with severe COVID-19, right? You know, and again, on the flip side of, of that, historically, these are a group that most at times we tend to exclude from clinical trials. Over to you, Lisa. Thank you. So to back onto what Taj just said, I just quickly had a look and he is spot on. The only the only country that was involved in the initial trials was South Africa for Paxlovid. So you're, you are absolutely right that, you know, there's a need here to get, there's a need to get better trial data in this space in general. I think that's a fair comment, but we also need to be privy to the perhaps lack of visibility on what that data is when we when we introduce programs like this. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Taj, and thank you, Cam. For that. Um, I guess to both of you, um, I guess seeing these risk factors, are there unique things that we should be doing um, in the ten countries where we're implementing? test and treat to make sure that high-risk patients are being treated more quickly. Taj, I don't know if you want to tackle, otherwise I'll, I'll, I'll lead into <laughs> Taj, your connection. Let me, let, let, let me, let, let me, um, can you hear me? Yeah, you're breaking up a little bit, um, <laughs> but yes, we, we can hear you now. 
All right. Uh, apologies for that. We just moved to a new a new site, and uh, we're still trying to figure out our best to improve our connectivity. So um, uh, let me say that uh, Africa CDC launched its um, test to treat um, strategy um, September uh, uh, this year. You know, and um, the goal here is about scaling up our testing on the continent, reducing transmission, but much more importantly, to reduce any potential severe outcome as far as COVID-19 is a, a, a concern. And uh, in terms of uh, ensuring that this iris group, you know, and le are not left uh, behind, you know, we also want to ensure that uh, for everything we do, we apply the equity lens, you know. And uh, one way Africa CDC think we can approach this is to integrate that test to treat or test and treat strategy within the primary care system, you know. So this is the only way we can ensure that, yeah, this uh, group are not left behind. And making sure that, um, our community um, health workers, you know, who actually are within the community, who live within the community, understand the community, are part and parcel of this particular, um, I mean, uh, a test to treat um, strategy. The previous um, colleague from um, Rwanda and Zambia have talked um, eloquently about, I mean, making use of our community um, health workers. So again, I think integration into the primary healthcare system will be key in ensuring that these are iris groups are captured because that's, I mean, uh, the, the first contact for most uh, of these um, iris um, uh, group and they are part of. Lisa, I think part of the issue that's going to be really important is that this program can't stand alone. Maybe that speaks also to what's um, what's been discussed by other speakers. It's also by making sure that we all have sort of a view of what's happening for the rest of the country. Are there groups that are being missed? Are there groups that are there patients who are presenting still with severe outcomes or having missed the opportunity to be involved in something like a test and treat program? where we can find that information and countries can observe that information from the, the sort of the full spectrum of their, of their country health system. There may well be groups who don't necessarily fall into a testing strategy street up front where we need these kind of learning programs to continue to educate ourselves to say, hey, look, this is a group that maybe we didn't focus so clearly on. Now we can readdress that. I think the very nature of this is going to be somewhat iterative in that regard. And maybe that also folds into a, I, if you don't mind, there's a good question here from Brooke in the in the in the Q and A, <clears throat> which sort of speaks to that in some degree, which is to sort of say, look, even the even the recognition of who is at high risk may well be changing over time. And I think you know the easiest example to look at that is from a vaccination point of view. You know, I think we've 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 both the first session speakers both. Uh, mentioned eloquently that their vaccine rates in, in Zambia and Rwanda have now improved dramatically. Uh, and so that affects risk. And so as that continues to change, and frankly, as we see changes in viral evolution that we've become pretty familiar with changing, that will impact the way the disease is, is felt. And I think that should come back to programs like this and impact the way that we continue to roll out our understanding of high risk and therefore how we direct our, our, our efforts. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Brooke. And thanks, Cam, for segueing us into to some questions. Um, just a reminder to the audience, um, if you have a question, please feel free to raise your hand, your virtual hand uh, or your real hand. Um, you can also um, put your question in chat. Um, and while we wait for uh, a few questions to come in, um, I guess um, as we sort of iterate through these high risk um, definitions for this test and treat program. Um, how, what do you think we're learning um, that will help us with other test and treat programs, if anything, at this point? All right. So, so come let, 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 let me go first. So, uh, a couple of things here. You know, um, when the COVID nineteen uh, pandemic started. On the continent of Africa, there were just two sites that had that capacity to, you know, to test, you know, and uh, we have to start moving people up and down, getting access to those test kits is also has been a, an issue. So I think for me, uh, one of the key things um, we, 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 are, we are seeing uh, from the Africa CDC, from the continent, is the fact that uh, you don't begin to fix your house when you need it. 
you need to fix well ahead of time. So meaning that as part of our preparedness, you know, we need to build all these um, uh, capacities. That's uh, number one. Number two, integrated approach. At the outset of this COVID-19 pandemic, the test is being done separately somewhere, reference labs. So you get the test, you know, your status, then you are referred to the clinic and all those things. You understand. So again, when you when you begin to uh, do that, it's continue to drive the transmission. You know, so if you have them as um, uh, one uh, one stop shop, whereby you test, then you treat. You know, I think that also go um, a long way to reduce that interval between when somebody knows is a status and when you begin to deploy a, a, a treatment, you know, that will allow, I mean, uh, uh, that will break the chain of transmission as much as possible and reduce the, 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 the secondary um, infection. Number three uh, for us, again, is the aspect of capacity building. Capacity building, you know, I think it's also a, a, a critical. You know, capacity building in terms of testing, capacity building in terms of uh, case management, I think uh, this is um, also key. Number four, it's um, using um, evidence to guide our um, decisions. You know, it's also very, very important because without, I mean, um, using science, you know, and data to get, um, uh, I mean, to guide our decisions, you know, you won't know who is most at risk. You know, you will not know who would benefit uh, from what. You know, and of course, from what I said much earlier on, we need to apply equity lens to all these clinical trials, be it in terms of diagnostics, be it in terms of therapeutics. Let me stop there. Cameron, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Taj. Um, I mean, I think there's, I would view this in a couple of ways. Number one, um, like you said, it, it really, I hope a program like this allows um, many, many groups to really have infrastructure put in place that then becomes relevant for the next illness. Um, I'd love to be here saying that COVID's going to be the last of our, you know, major issues, but we know that's not true. And so is there a confidence that can come out of a program like this? Is there a speed and a pace that we can, we can demonstrate? Uh, there are things that we can learn that show that, that it is different in every different country. I suspect that's true. I suspect it's different in the different clinics within every country and down all the way down to the grassroots described earlier. So I think learning that experience here sets you up in a great context for, for what will come next. You know, this, this, this in itself sort of builds a little bit, doesn't it, off, off sort of HIV test and treat programs that have begun to become uh, so much more widespread and effective. But I think there's a lot to still learn. Actually, I'll pause there. Hmm. Yeah. And, and again, just a, a reminder, I mean, again, this is exactly why, um, right, we're having this learning network session and why we want to have future learning network sessions is to have an open dialogue in real time about um, what, what are we learning um, that's going to accelerate implementation for this test and treat program? What are some of the, um, as Taj was mentioning, what are some of the infrastructure needs that we need to be planning um, and building um, sort of, again, as it's acutely, as we're acutely aware of these deficiencies moving forward. Um, Diana, um, would you like to talk to your question uh, that you put in chat or speak to your question, please? This, this may be both, uh, this may be, I, I think, for our first panel as well. I'm interested in here and learning from our panelists. Um, if you're running into any resistance um, to the program or to the idea of the program as you're beginning to uh, <clears throat> roll it out um, in high risk populations or beyond, and if so, how how are you responding to that? How are you even preparing to respond to that? Um, and linked to that is misinformation, which has obviously been such a major scourge during the pandemic in general. So I'm interested in how you're thinking about that countering it or if you're running into it already. I mean, I mean, I can answer it from a protocol point of view, but I'd love to defer to my, my in-country colleagues on the actual field. I mean, I think from a protocol point of view, one of the things we've tried to capture as we roll this out is an understanding of how effectively and how quickly patients are being um, identified, tested, and have access to drug. And so indirectly, that becomes a measure of sort of success of penetrance of the message that this is an important healthcare intervention. And comparing that across country, across site and across time, um, I think we'll begin to hint at that answer. 
It doesn't necessarily identify the people who you don't see, though. And of course, there to your question, the people who maybe have fallen foul of some skepticism. So I, I'd love to hear from others if they've experienced in country skepticism already. Yeah, um, I might ask uh, um, Dr. Edson, Professor Malenga, Taj, if you could share your thoughts, experiences on this question. All right, Lisa, let, let, let me go first and allow my member states uh, to come in. So uh, again, Diana, thank you for that question. So I think the issue of um, resistance, uh, uh, again, I think our approach is also key here. Uh, many times when it comes to clinical trial or research in general on the continent of Africa, the communities are not carried along. You know, they are not carried along at all. Now, if you do not carry community along, you know, in the course of developing your protocol, you developing your, your trial site, you only come to them when you want to administer your intervention. Then you give them paper, consent paper. And I mean, whether you like it or not, more than 50%, we resist. At the point of admission consent paper is not the time to carry the committee along. You need to take them along right from outset, right from day one. The aspect of misinformation, uh, as Africa CDC, we're currently running or tracking COVID-19 vaccine confidence on the continent. So what we are getting from that, which is also applicable to any new um, intervention, is the fact that most people do not have adequate information to make decisions. You know, so in the absence of adequate information, there is no way you can make an informed decision. You know, and uh, so whatever information that is out there, whether true or right, that's the one you continue to, 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 to spread. So I think two things here, community engagement, timely community engagement is key. Number two, we need to provide uh, people with adequate information that will allow them to make informed decisions. Thank you, over to Lisa. Thank you, Taj. Um, Professor Malenga or Dr. Edson, do you want to add anything to this important question? Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, go um, ahead, doctor. Okay, all right, so, so go ahead. Uh, yes, of course. thank you. So uh, we have been recording some people who are, are hesitant to, uh, to medication for now. And uh, mainly it's due to the fact that people are already vaccinated, boosted, I've already got second booster and they don't feel like it's important to, to get medication. But all this goes or coupled with the education. And uh, that's why when you look at the data we have now, uh, out of more than almost uh, 1,000 people who uh, medication that we have already uh, dis distributed into different health centers, uh, people still uh, have that kind of hesitance in terms of uh, getting medication. And uh, I think, as uh, they've just mentioned, uh, what's most important is how we educate our people. And now we are looking on how we, we, we're going to strategize this and make sure that uh, we, we put into different uh, radio and, and TV spots and people get to, to know what's the importance of uh, getting treated earlier and uh, making sure that they, uh, they get tested as soon as possible. I think this is most important. and. Uh, uh, the fact is that uh, it reduces the, the, the risk of being hospitalized. So I think that that's very key word that should be put uh, when we are educating our, our, our patients. Thank you. Um, I guess we have probably time for just some last thoughts. Uh, Professor Malenga, do you wanna come in on this question before we close? Um, I, I think uh, Dr. Edson, um, and also, uh, Dr. Raj, they have uh, really um, addressed this question. We have not received the commodities so far, but I expect the same challenges which we are going to have. And uh, um, as we said, engaging from the beginning and using the, the primary healthcare approach is very key. And for people to know that uh, this is part of the routine health services being provided. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Cam and Taj, and uh, for a, a really great panel. And I, I guess I also just wanted, before I turn it back over to Krishna, thank all of our panelists um, for getting our learning network off to such a great start. And, and again, in the spirit of sharing and collaboration, really um, helping to accelerate learning as we 
as we go through this program um, in real time. So um, Krishna, back over to you. Great, thank you, Lisa. I'll add my thanks to all of our discussants and all of our participants. Great to, uh, to see this um, move forward. Uh, just to recap briefly, I think we started by recognizing there continues to be an urgent need. COVID is not over and, and the paradigm for test and treat as a mechanism to complement continued access to vaccines is certainly necessary for long-term COVID management around the world. At both the country and the regional levels, I think we started to hear some of the key lessons learned and, and insights first around integration. These can't be standalone programs. They have to be integrated into existing programs, facilities, and mechanisms. Second, we have to be able to use this as an opportunity to continue to build capacity, both for COVID, but also for primary health care and other needs. And third, I think we heard how important it is to engage communities and individuals to make sure that there's appropriate information, health literacy, uh, as well as to make sure that our programs are responsive to the needs and priorities of our own communities. We also heard about the importance of community health workers as the workforce that in essence is the glue that holds all these pieces together and are gonna be really important to try to decentralize these efforts as much as possible. And we should recognize that while programs like these are opportunities to continue to strengthen the evidence base, uh, we have much work to do in our clinical trials and clinical research broadly to make sure that they are more equitable in capturing data and evidence from the places where uh, equity is, is most important to, to consider uh, globally. Uh, with that, uh, I'll thank everyone again for joining us. Note that this will be a monthly series of our learning network and just one of many mechanisms we'll be rolling out to both capture and share insights and evidence. So as a next step, please stay engaged. We will send you very shortly both a summary as well as a recording uh, of this session. Please share those across your networks. Stay engaged with us. Send us your questions, the topics you'd like to see covered in these and other discussions going forward. With that, thank you all for joining us today and a good morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever in the world you might be. Thank you all.